Kurt Cobain, the enigmatic frontman of Nirvana, forever altered the landscape of rock music with his raw talent and unique artistry. Today we'll take a quick look at some of his lesser known guitars, primarily those used during the early days of Nirvana and prior to the release of Nevermind. This is a three-part video series where we will explore Kurt's guitars used around the release of the three official Nirvana albums, share the stories behind them, and discover how they influence the band's sound. If you're a fan of Kurt Cobain and enjoy guitar stories in general, make sure to subscribe and check out our website at groundguitar.com. This is one of the least known yet profoundly significant guitars in Kurt's collection, and it highly impacted his taste in guitars later on. To unravel the mystery of its origin, we must look for clues in this particular photograph. We know that it was taken at Kurt's mom's house in Aberdeen, Washington, and that it was not taken in his actual childhood room, but in the hallway that connected the two bedrooms on the top floor. A closer examination of the photo reveals a few concert flyers adorning the wall behind Kurt. Most notably, one promoting the band Dr. No, who played a downtown Takuma, a two-hour drive from Kurt's place. On September 27, 1986, which obviously means that the photo was taken around that event, this was a long time before Nirvana became a thing, coinciding with Kurt's recording of the renowned Fecal Matter demo tape. Hence, this very guitar served as his practice instrument, accompanied him during his debut live performances, and likely bore witness to the recording of his initial songs. Based on the other photos available on the internet, Kurt retained his guitar until around early 1988, Consequently, it featured in the early Nirvana gigs, as the band commenced performing in 1987, initially under the name Skid Row, and later briefly adopted the moniker Bliss. Notably, the photos also captured that Kurt painted the pick guard pink at some point, probably with a marker, and he had a ton of stickers on the body of the guitar. It unfortunately is very hard to tell what these stickers were exactly, so if you happen to recognize any of them, be sure to leave a comment below. As far as what happened to this guitar, that's unfortunately unknown too. In one of the earliest film performances of Nirvana, we can see Kurt playing the exact same model, but without all of the stickers. It could be that he decided to clean up his old high flyer, or it could be that this was a brand new guitar. Regardless, this presumed second high flyer met a tragic end in October 1988, when Kurt shattered it into pieces. From that point onwards, he started playing a makeshift Fender Mustang. This Fender Mustang originally arrived in Kurt's possession as a nearly bare canvas, devoid of a pickguard and any electronics. It is likely that he acquired it from someone he knew or from a guitar part shop, intending to refurbish it himself. And that's precisely what he did, in his own unique way. Kurt salvaged a pickup from his old and shattered Unibox, along with the complete control panel attached to its pickguard. This move spared him the need for any complex electrical work or soldering, as he simply installed the electronics as they were. The guitar at this point was either red or brown, and in January 1989, Kurt decided that it needed a pickguard. Rather than opting for an authentic Fender pickguard, he cut out a vinyl record featuring a Christian sermon titled, Where Are the Dead? by Thomas Road Baptist Church. By April, the Mustang underwent further transformation, now sporting a light green finish, and Kurt finally installed a proper pickguard on it. He was photographed with his guitar in this exact state on the album cover for Bleach, Notably, on the same photo, Jason Everman also boasted a pickguard crafted from a vinyl record on his Telecaster. It's crucial to acknowledge that Bleach was recorded between December 1988 and January 1989, and most accounts suggest that Kurt used a Unibox High Flyer guitar during the studio sessions. This is pretty confusing because we know that Kurt broke his Unibox in October of 1988, and from that point on, used this Mustang. So he either didn't use a Unibox on the record, or he had another Unibox stash somewhere. Which brings us to the next guitar. In May 1989, Kurt started using a Unibox High Flyer Phase 3 with a natural transparent finish and a maple fretboard. Approximately a month later, he sought to add a personal touch to the guitar, applying red paint along the edges to create a sunburst effect. However, this DIY endeavor utilized a cheap can of spray paint, making the red layer less scratch-resistant compared to the enduring bottom yellow layer, which can be clearly seen on the recent photos of the guitar. Sadly, like many of Kurt's guitars, this Univox's fate was short-lived, meeting its demise during Nirvana's July 13th concert at Maxwell's in Hoboken, New Jersey. Following its destruction, the guitar was stripped of all its electronics and found its way into the hands of Janet Billing, who was apparently close with the band and worked with Sub Pop. 
Subsequently, the guitar appeared on auction at least twice, initially at Sotheby's in 2014 and later at Julian's in 2016. The final auction at Julian's concluded the price of $56,250. Intriguingly, the guitar was sold with all the electronics intact in the body. However, it remains unknown where these components originated from and who installed them, as they are not the original ones, for reasons already explained. Finally, it's worth noting that the recent museum exhibits of this guitar often mention its association with the recording of Bleach. While this possibility exists, it's again important to clarify that Bleach was recorded a few months before Kurt was first spotted playing this particular Univox guitar, creating a slight discrepancy in the timeline. After Kurt broke the Maple Fretboard Univox, he played one gig on this random 1973 Fender Mustang, which predictably met the same destructive fate that very night, followed by a gig he just sang because he didn't have a working guitar that night. Finally, on the night of July 18th, he picked up a new white Univox High Flyer Phase 3. This particular guitar was purchased in Seattle by his girlfriend at the time, Tracy Miranda, and then sent to him via his friend Matt while he was on tour with Nirvana. I really like Univoxes, and those are what I play all the time, and they're hard yeah. to find because they're Mosrite copies, and they were made in the late 60s and early 70s, and you just have to find them by chance in pawn shops, and I'm yeah. stupidly breaking them <laughs> yeah. every time I get one. Based on photos, Kurt brought the white Univox with him on the band's inaugural European tour, and relied on it until around mid-November 1989. The reason why he stopped using it at that point is, again, predictably because he destroyed it on the night of November 11th and Ecstasy in Berlin. Apparently that night, technical troubles plagued the band's equipment, leading to a shortened set and fueled by frustration during the performance of Breed, Kurt ultimately destroyed his beloved white Univox. And from this point on and until the band made a break to record Nevermind, it was basically a story of whatever guitar Kurt could get his hands on. During the remainder of the 1989 European tour, he turned to a red Hangstorm F200, a vintage Swedish-made guitar, only to smash it on November 29th in Rome, Italy. For the last five shows on the tour, he relied on a black-and-white Washburn Force 31, which he once again subjected to destruction on December 3rd, marking the end of the European tour. Upon the band's return to the U.S. on December 20th, Kurt made a purchase at a store called Topkick Jewelry and Loans in Takuma, acquiring a Hondo 737, a budget-friendly Gibson Les Paul copy. However, the first gig that Nirvana played back home on January 6, 1990, at the University of Washington in Seattle, Kurt used a Gibson SG, which was a guitar that he traded with his friend Sluggo Cawley for his old destroyed 1973 Fender Mustang. Collie's SG had been gathering dust on a wall in his room and was in dire need of refurbishment, which Kurt promptly addressed upon his return from Europe in 1989. He spruced it up by painting it light blue and fitting a Univox High Flyer Phase 3 humbucker in the bridge position and a single coil pickup in the neck position. This customized SG served him occasionally until late February when it met its fate at Iguanas in Tijuana, Mexico, joining the ranks of the other Smash guitars. The SG was in rotation together with the previously mentioned Hondo 737, which Kurt played until he destroyed it a few weeks earlier at Satyricon in Portland on January 12th. Around this time, Kurt also had a Japanese-made Epiphone ET270, which he used from February to April 26th when, you guessed it, he smashed it at the Pyramid Club in New York. From this point on, things get even more confusing. On February 9th at Pine Street Theatre in Portland, Kurt was seen playing and destroying a light blue Mustang, likely the same one used earlier in 1989. What remained of this guitar ended up on display at the Museum of Pop Culture in Seattle, founded by Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen in 2000. Interestingly, from the photos, one can clearly see that this guitar has been painted more than once. Also, around this same period, Kurt had three homemade hybrid Mustangs that he and Chris built in their garage. In fact, we even built a bunch of Mustangs one time. We bought some necks and made and, and took pieces of wood and cut out the bodies and, and put the necks on, and they were completely out of tune all the time. And well, we did a pretty good job. At we it. had this little assembly line in the garage, and we hung them up and painted them yeah. and stuff. The first was a blue or light green one with a black pickguard featuring a random photo of Jesus, used during a gig on February 14th at the Kennel Club in San Francisco, where it was destroyed. 
The neck of the guitar was actually picked up by one of the visitors of our website, Jeff, who was kind enough to share some photos of it. The second homemade Mustang was pink and met its end at Bogarts in Long Beach on February 16th, disappearing afterwards with its current whereabouts unknown. And lastly, the third homemade Mustang was used in April and May and was famously seen in the iconic Sub Pop in Bloom music video. This guitar was also most likely destroyed sometime during this period, although there is currently no photographic evidence of this. In May 1990, Kurt acquired an Aria Pro CS350 guitar, which he used during the latter part of the Bleach Club tour. This instrument was another departure from Kurt's usual choices and was most likely purchased due to its affordability. There are a couple of interesting stories related to this particular guitar. First, during a show at the Milestone in Charlotte on May 2nd, Kurt playfully modified the lyrics of Love Buzz to express his disdain for this particular guitar. Second, after the guitar was destroyed on September 22nd at the Motorsports International Garage in Seattle, it ended up in three pieces. The body was split in half and the neck was broken off. One of the pieces was recovered and was likely auctioned by someone and it can nowadays be seen at the Museum of Pop Culture in Seattle. The smaller part of the body was however picked up by a completely different person who incidentally visited our website and left a very cool photo of it. It would be cool if one day these two pieces would be together again, perhaps alongside the missing neck, completing the puzzle. It was, after all, the guitar Kurt hated the most. From around mid-May to August 1990, Nirvana decided to take a break from touring, during which Kurt Cobain got his hands on a Moss Wright Gospel Mark IV guitar. The Moss Wright Gospel Mark IV was the inspiration behind the Univox High Flyer model making it akin to getting an authentic Fender after years of playing cheap Squire copies. As expected, the Mosrai became Kurt's primary guitar, and from August onwards, most kids were performed on this instrument. However, its last known appearance was on February 2nd, 1991, when Kurt and Dave were photographed playing with Slim Moon's band, Witchy Poo. Shortly thereafter, the Mosrai vanished and Kurt himself confirmed its unfortunate fate in his journals, noting that it, along with two other guitars, had been stolen. Despite this setback, Kurt found consolation in acquiring a left-handed Fender Jaguar. Funnily enough, this 1965 Fender Jaguar eventually became one of Kurt's best-known guitars, accompanying him extensively during the Nevermind tour and several studio sessions. Thus, one can ponder how different Kurt's guitar collection narrative might have been had the Moss Wright not been stolen. But as things currently stand, the Moss Wright somehow ended up in a pawn shop, likely sold by the person who stole it. Coincidentally, the person who then purchased the guitar from the shop has an online presence and an account on Steel Guitar forums, and he made a post detailing his experience. According to him, the guitar was in a case that read Nirvana, with an E instead of an I, and F Elvis on top. Based on what can be found online, the Moss Wright was sold at least twice in the recent years, first in 2004 for $117,500 to the only bidder, and the second time in 2006 when the closing price was $131,450. The current owner of the guitar is unknown, but it is accounted for and can occasionally be seen in various museums. Before heading over to Europe to play a BBC session and do a six-show UK tour in October 1990, Kurt bought his very first Fender Stratocaster, a white left-handed made in Japan model. He then quickly modified this guitar by adding a black slanted humbucker pickup in the bridge position and a K record sticker on the top of the body. The sticker was a homage to an independent record label in Olympia, Washington, and Kurt had the exact same design tattooed on his left arm. This white Fender Stratocaster quickly became Kurt's go-to guitar, while the Moss Wright Gospel remained by his side as a reliable backup, likely to protect it from potential damage during performances. Also, on one occasion during the No More Wars Benefit concert in Olympia on January 18, 1991, Kurt played the White Strat for most of the gig, but unexpectedly switched to a cheap red Memphis Stratocaster towards the end of the show, and then proceeded to smash it with a hammer. As for the White Strat, it had its last appearance on April 17th during the OK Hotel show, after which it mysteriously vanished. But month prior to that, 
Kurt had acquired another Japanese Stratocaster, this time in black and had a black humbucker installed in it, of an unknown brand and model. The two Strats were Kurt's primary guitars for live performances during those couple of months and before the band entered the studio in May 1990 and started recording their next album. And this basically marks the end of the Bleach era and therefore the end of this video. Thanks for watching and be sure to subscribe if you enjoyed watching this type of content. And if you don't want to miss the next part where we will be focusing on Nevermind guitars which include the previously mentioned Chaguar, the famous Vandalism Strat and the blue competition Mustang.